conversation um, for the uh, for the conference is the, um, a conversation around digital communities and whether they're organizing or polarizing or possibly a bit of both. Um, and to discuss this, um, we have three people coming from very different and very rich experiences. Uh, Susan Banesh is the executive director of the Dangerous Speech Project and a faculty associate at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. Rachel Stein is the executive director of campaigns and strategy at Stonewall. And Taik Taik Ong is the executive director of the Myanmar ICT for Development organization. So thank you for joining us for this conversation. Um, what I shared in the opening remarks uh, maybe begins to explain a little bit of why we wanted to have this conversation at Build Peace. Um, but I just wanted to mention one other area of interest that prompted us to ask this question uh, from our perspective. Um, at Build Up, we've been implementing an intervention that's very relevant to this conversation. Uh, between June and December of 2017, in partnership with MIT and with funding from Humanity X, uh, we ran a pilot program that explored interventions that addressed polarization on both Facebook and Twitter in the US. Um, and there's some information about it online if you want more details on it, but essentially we think it worked. Um, we have evidence that the interventions made people reflect on the way that we were engaging on social media. Um, and based on what we learned, we're now pre preparing to roll out a larger scale intervention. So if you're interested in seeing that, you can come and talk to me later about it. Um, and I think that's another reason that I'm personally very interested in this conversation about what is happening um, to online communities. Um, and so I wanted to start by asking each of you, by way of also introducing yourselves, if you could um, tell us why you or your organization is interested in this question. So maybe take take. Yes. Like your best. Yeah. So, um, yeah, um, thank you for having me here. So, um, in, in the case of Myanmar, um, for us, um, in around um, 2012, no, um, we started this um, organization called uh, Myanmar ICT for Development Organization that focused on using technology and social change because we were very positive from our experience that um, you know technology can really bring forward um, you know um, what's been missing in the country for quite a long time transparency democracy and so on and so forth so um, around 2007 um, so so it was a uh, it, it, it's it's the starting of um, you know um, people normal people using internet for the first time and then um, we have this um, um, in uh, we have this um, um, thing called the Saffron Revolution, which is um, uh, which is quite like the um, 88 student uprising in Myanmar, where people try to challenge the military junta. But uh, but in 2007, people started to use the internet. And then there are very big protests that happens all around the country. But we were very positive, because at that time, the internet was there. And we know that it couldn't be like the history where you know the, the students were killed and the the military took over. We know that it couldn't happen again because there's much more um, a window to the wall where you know we can show what's happening in the country and so on and so forth. And then I think because we were bloggers at that time, we tried to blog everything that happened and then put it up online so that the whole world can see. And and it kind of brought a positivity to us. Okay, internet is good. Uh, it can even really bring um, you know this. Um, um, it can really bring uh, democracy to a country where it has been lost before. And we were positive, so we started that. But then after that, we were not very sure of that anymore because, you know, of how people in Myanmar became to use the internet, primarily in terms of, you know, uh, promoting hate and so on and so forth. And then we thought that, okay, um, you know, technology, it's, um, it's, uh, it seems like helping us. But then in, on the other hand, it also is a very big challenge to us. If we don't actually learn how these things work, if we don't actually be prepared to it, we will be, you know, we will be failing to, to what the technology or what the social media will be doing to the country. So since that time, we started to do some research, particularly on how information gets spread on the internet, how people's perspectives being, um, being affected by it, and then you know, try to think about solutions to actually overcome and you know, make a much more you know, uh, use tech for peace. So I think from the positivity and then the skepticism, you know, really brought us to what, you know, to what um, we are doing right now as an yeah. organization yeah. as a whole. So really both sides of the organizing yes. and the polarizing, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. 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 Great, thank you. Rachel, what about, what about you? Um, so I work for an organisation called Stonewall, which some of you uh, may have heard of, but we're an LGBT equality organisation that works 
uh, predominantly in the UK but also increasingly um, across the world, with both with activists on the ground, with communities on the ground, with governments in the ground, but also with organisations. Um, I think we're particularly interested in this conversation uh, because, uh, to the previous point, we, we can see the benefits of technologies from, from both sides. On one hand, um, for many LGBT people, particularly young LGBT people, digital communities are absolutely fundamental to their identities. Um, they're often the first place where um, young LGBT people have ever met another LGBT person. Uh, they're the first place where they ever feel that they can be open and be themselves truly. Um, and they're the first place where they finally feel that what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, what they're experiencing is, um, is valid and is something that other people understand and associate with. It makes them feel not alone, which is obviously a very, very, it's, it's an incredibly important tool for, for a lot of LGBT people, particularly young people. However, at the same time, it's also a space, digital spaces are also a space where um, that evoke a lot of homophobia, a lot of biphobia, and particularly at the moment what we're seeing, um, a lot of transphobia and a lot of very, very polarised debate um, about, um, about identity go, happens on the internet. Um, so from our perspective, this sort of dichotomy between how, um, how digital communities and digital spaces can be very affirming and very positive but also at the same time very, very isolating um, is why this is a particularly important and relevant conversation for us. Yeah, wonderful. So another kind of aspect of this, like it's both the, you know, the, you can see the organising potential but also the problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Susan? I um, founded this thing called the Dangerous Speech Project because um, of concern about what rhetoric and other forms of human communication um, can lead to, mm -hmm. what sort of uh, uh, harmful effects mm -hmm. communication online and offline can bring uh, with specific interest in violence. Mm -hmm. And um, dangerous speech, as we've defined it, is any kind of human communication that can lower normal social barriers against violence. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, I started out studying the... the um, uh, destructive or unfortunate side of this. Uh, now though, uh, together with my colleagues, we've become very much interested uh, and maybe even most interested in the most effective ways of disrupting that kind of harmful mm -hmm. communication uh, or maybe even more usefully diminishing its effect uh, on people. So uh, we've been thinking quite a lot about communities online since uh, we have found that some of the most innovative, uh, creative, sometimes even artistic uh, responses are being carried out by individuals or by communities. In some cases, there are groups of people who are forming online specifically around responding to what we call dangerous or harmful speech. Um, they, uh, uh, of course, this raises the question that, that uh, I think it might be interesting for us to consider, which uh, Lord Alderdice already gestured toward, namely, what is a community? You know, yeah. What is a community? Offline? That's not as easy a question as it might seem to answer. And then, what is a community online? And then maybe once we get a grip on that, we can think about whether uh, offline and online communities are necessarily polarizing. I think they're not, but I, I, I'm sort of mischievously tossing out these questions to see uh, so what, do, what, do what you think. Why don't we start with that question, Susan? Uh, you know, digital communities is a, is a contested term. So tell us what you think a digital community is. What does that even mean and what are, how do yeah. you go about defining it? Well, I'll, I'll be delighted to give it a try uh, <laughs> on the understanding that, that uh, you'll come up with much better ideas yeah. uh, and correct me. Um, so offline, a community, uh, as, as I said, it's not so easy to define. The easiest and earliest uh, you know, way of describing communities offline was um, by geography or locality. You know, a village was a community. For example, when an anthropologist 
would go and study a community. It was usually all the people in one particular place who mostly spent their lives in that place and interacted with one another. But then that led to a new way of describing a community, which is people who interact with each other in a certain way. Um, but maybe that also wasn't sufficient, and so then community became people who shared some sort of an identity. Or, and, and I think this is maybe the most uh, useful uh, metric for online life, people who share some kind of purpose or some kind of effort that they are uh, pursuing together. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the most uh, useful defining characteristic of the sorts of communities that I'm now studying with my colleagues. For example, um, the group, or uh, I'll just uh, um, in deference call them groups for now. They are groups of people who form specifically around their desire to respond collectively and constructively to hatred mm -hmm. online. That's the, the, really the, the, the only thing that brings them together. Uh, they do this, however, according to certain specific rules, even about what their uh, discourse norms are, the sorts of language that they use or the way uh, in which they respond. Mm -hmm. And then um, to follow our theme, um, I would maybe uh, offer another question, which is, is the formation of, an, uh, formation of an online community around, for example, a shared purpose also necessarily polarizing? Since very often those communities form because of their shared um, opposition to some other group of people or what some other group of people are doing. Um, or their shared alarm about another group of people. Uh, yeah. I don't think that online communities are necessarily polarizing, but uh, uh, they often, uh, almost <coughs> inadvertently, yeah. are. So I'm actually going to very directly point that question to Rachel, because I, <laughs> unfortunately for you, know a little bit about the work that Stonewall has been doing, and so I think this is actually a very relevant question for you, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So um, I would say that from recent experience at Stonewall, I would, I would say that it is almost impossible, or we have found it almost impossible to have nuanced conversation online. And that actually when um, by one of, so the very specific example that we've been working with Build Up on uh, is, about, is about trans equality. Uh, trans people's equality, particularly in this in in this country, because of a government consultation that's happening or has is happening at the moment, um, and um, the nature of the conversation has become so polarized um, that it's only possible to hold two opinions, um, and it's only possible only one to, of two. You mean? Oh, oh yes, sorry, but two opposite <laughs> opinions exactly. I hold one of two possible <laughs> opinions, um, and if you involve yourself with the conversation in either way, um, then you are being polarising. And, um, and there is a lot of unity for both of these uh, positions, but no room for nuance or middle ground, or very, very little space for middle ground to be heard without it being presumed to be polarising. Um, so a part of our part of our ongoing strategy that we've been working with Elena on um, is how we can how we can reach middle ground and not be perceived to be part of the polarization, but also hopefully quieten other voices, which in itself is a polarizing concept. So um, it, it's all quite um, it, it's very very difficult, and um, we've certainly seen that that, you know, from our perspective, there's sort of two options. You either are involved and you are communicating and you are taking part or seem to be taking part in a polarised debate, or you say nothing, which is just as isolating for many people. Um, and, um, you know, as, a, as an advocacy policy organisation, is not necessarily, it's counterproductive to what we do as an organisation. Um, so it's a challenge that we face daily. Yeah. Um, and I think 
are working on but don't have solutions for <laughs> as of yet. But. Yeah. yeah, and I think one thing that's uh, that's quite interesting also from that experience is that the, the two, you know, you said there's these two, uh, one of two opinions that you can hold and sort of one of two communities in that yeah. sense that you can belong to. And these are communities that have largely organised in order to defend from hate Correct. or from what they perceive as hate from yes. the other, right? Yes, if I can... absolutely. So that's... And they both perceive the other position to be as hateful. So maybe, Taik Taik, what about you? What do you think about this this idea about, you know, the, the difficulty with organizing online without creating polarization? And I actually have a particular question for you because I'm, I'm wondering if you would, because I also know a little bit about your experience, if you would comment on who you feel is responsible for creating the conditions for healthy organizing online, for the creation of more healthy communities. Is it... Uh, is it platforms? Is it users? So the people who are organizing? Is it policy makers? You know, who should be intervening in this polarization? So yeah, uh, so um, when we talk about, you know, uh, communities, of course, after the internet and social media, we have diverted from the very traditionalist view of what is community, where rather than basing on locality, just basic interests or purposes and so on and so forth, we come to a much more complex level of, you know, defining a community. We, we, on the on the digital level, and uh, and when we talk about that, um, you know, right now uh, many of the people are actually uh, finger pointing the platform because okay, it's algorithms, it's bias, and technology, and so on and so forth. I won't deny that, but I will get to that afterwards. But I think you know, one of the um, uh, main uh, reasons also lies on the on the. Uh, you know the um, the psychology of you know you know of us humans as well. Like for example, um, we are very um, we are very um, comfortable in seeking to much more um, views which which we can actually um, agree on rather than which we can't agree on. Mm -hmm. So you know technology really is uh, making promoting you know it's supporting that that you know that 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 behavior and with all those you know um, algorithms that they had actually had made because you know when we talk about you know personalization online you know and you know the personalization is the word that has been used to actually profile people and make us much more polarized to different views so i think you know human behavior is also very it's also a very basic steps in uh, that we also have to change i think that's why you know personal behavior using using arts culture music it's also important to make us accept to much more um, you know diversity and so on so forth that on the other hand you know the platforms that the, the technology uh, you know, are also responsible in terms of because you know algorithms are actually created by humans you know humans have biases you know technologists has biases and so you know um, I think on the other hand the platform although not they don't you know it's not their sole res no, 100 percent responsibility but I think in this term they play a very big role in terms of uh, you know um, supporting the polarizations in the digital communities as well. And when we talk about uh, policy makers, uh, I mean, um, policy makers in terms of like, for example, I come from Myanmar, which is, um, you know, which is very, you know, policy makers are very, actually very new to this, um, to this technology and internet policies and so on and so forth. So it's actually very difficult for, you know, uh, uh, policymakers, particularly from the global south, to actually make much more meaningful policy towards addressing these issues. Like for example, in EU, um, you know they have um, they have this GDPR, which which is you know addressing privacy. Mm -hmm. And you know I think you know these kinds of you know um, policies that we re that's related with you know uh, opening out from the uh, personalizations. Yeah. You know maybe, maybe yeah. might might work. Yeah. to make you know these things much more better. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I mean I think it's very interesting mm -hmm. what you're saying because you're saying in one way, you know, the underlying human characteristics that mm -hmm. result in a polarized debate yeah. are there. Mm -hmm. Those are the users, mm -hmm. if you want, mm -hmm. right? Um, but somehow the platforms amplify that, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And right. so mm -hmm. maybe there is some responsibility. Yes. Yes. And maybe policymakers could be protecting from right. some exactly. of that exactly. and, and are not doing so. Mm -hmm. So it's kind mm -hmm. of like the responsibility mm -hmm. Is sharing. Yes. I'm mm -hmm. curious to hear whether what you think about about this question as well. I agree completely mm -hmm. with what Dida said. Yeah. And I can't re improve on it much. I think that's just exactly right. <laughs> that's so I'm just plus one on that one. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, mean, I, I also agree. I don't think that it's the responsibility only of mm. any specific mm. group to solve, yeah. you know, the issues that we're seeing. It that's impossible, and it's you know, um, I I think that you're. I think that if the issue, as you seem to be saying, is mm-hmm. is human behaviour, <laughs> that's a massive mm-hmm. thing that we obviously that you know it means yeah. there's no quick fix mm-hmm. for how this is going to be. Um, how how we can help to um, solve issues of polarization in digital mm-hmm. communities, okay. um, um, but maybe that's natural. Maybe if maybe if it's being replicated in a in a offline yeah. scenario, then that's a natural. Yeah. yeah. Like pre- I, no, I'm, I'm just mentioning about pre-existing bias that society sure. has really affect on how technology works. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. I can offer some kind of contrarian ideas Mm -hmm. about uh, online life Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and communities and humans and all the ways in which we were already terrible before technology. (laughs) Um, So the first one is that uh, uh, you could say for, uh, for human beings to hate each other is nothing new. On the contrary. Although no human has ever been born hating another one, unfortunately, humans have been teaching each other to despise and fear other groups of people for as far back as we can remember. Um, so that's not new. What is new is that a very large number of people around the room, around the world, I, it's funny that I said around the room, because I'm, I'm, I feel very confident in saying that all of the people in this room are already disrupting that long-standing human practice of looking down on or despising or in particular fearing. I think fear is a much more important emotion than hatred where all of this is concerned. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to make a, um, a, a daring but I think very safe bet that all of the people in this room are already escaping from that long-standing human practice. And it's not just all of you. It's uh, safe to say tens of thousands of people around the world have already accepted the idea that that's not good. So that's quite shocking and uh, new and different. That's one change. Second one is that online, humans are exposed to the views of very different identity groups um, much more and much more often than was ever the case before. So you could say that it is, um, and I don't mean this flippantly, I'm just trying to find a good way to express it. You could say that this is a brand new sport Hmm. that we human beings are still trying to learn. For example, for trans people to be interacting with people who don't believe that there is such a thing as a trans person, you know, offline that would have been extremely, extremely unlikely before the internet. So, those conversations are tremendously conflictive, but uh, uh, one way to, to, to think about it is that those conversations are like some extremely extreme form of bungee jumping that we as humans are only just beginning even to attempt to do yeah. and never did before. Mm-hmm. So that's the second thing. And the third, okay, sorry, two more really fast points. The third one, um, We now have mountains and mountains of data, or we don't, but mostly the uh, tech companies, Mm -hmm. have gigantic mountains of data that we could imagine as, you know, gold mines, because they've got these incredible Mm -hmm. um, uh, loads, L-O-D-E-S, like loads of, you know, precious Mm -hmm. things, um, of knowledge hidden in there on how it is that human beings can... Uh, interact even across enormous gulfs of difference yeah. uh, constructively. Uh, but we have not yet, for the most part, found the way mm-hmm. to study that. That's, yeah. That is something that is astonishingly new. And the last point is that generally, in response to your question, Elena, um, when we talk about trying to improve communication online, in general, there are only two sorts of actors discussed. One is the companies and the other is governments. Um, I'm with my colleagues increasingly studying what everybody else does, that is to say, users, Mm -hmm. since it turns out that 
users, as I said before, both as individuals and as groups, are quietly doing some astonishing things, including, of course, in Myanmar. That's where there are some of the most interesting experiments going on. Uh, but, but really daring, really uh, counterintuitive, creative, artistic, very often using humor in astonishing ways. Uh, and by the way, humor can be used to deliver hatred and vitriol terribly effectively. It can also be used to disrupt them in shocking and often apparently very effective ways. So um, I would just uh, encourage us not to forget that. So I, I want to make a comment on one of the Please. points that you made, and then I want to throw one of your questions mm -hmm. back to Tai Tai, mm -hmm. and I'll come back because I have another question for you as well, Rachel. But um, the comment is that um, uh, we had a fringe event uh, on Friday um, uh, up in Derry at uh, mm. with Ulster University, and, and Brandon and I, who's, who's somewhere in the room, we're talking afterwards um, about how there's actually um, another situation in which in which humans have not uh, connected with people who are very different to them, and then very suddenly began to, and that was a very rapid process of urbanization at the beginning of the 20th century. Absolutely. And there's actually a fair amount of writing from um, particularly American sociologists concerned about the loss of humanity and the sort of the, the shock to the human brain of suddenly being exposed to people who were so different to them, and the fear about whether um, you know what policy had to be done, had to be made, in particularly in urban planning. You know about how how to organize the urban space to minimize that that kind of shock to the clash to the, to the sudden connection with people who were very different and, and, and you know being exposed to such different views, etc. Um, and I don't, I mean, I'm not an expert in urban sociology, but I, it is something I find very interesting. And one of the things that's most interesting is that it was through the creativity and ingenuity of individual citizens that a lot of the connections that were necessary for bi vibrant urban environments happened. So it's kind of, it's just a parallel to what you're saying about, well, maybe we should stop talking so much about the planning and the platforms and focus on what users can do to change the conditions, which is also very much what Stonewall is, mm. is trying to do with the trans debate. So I think it's really interesting. Or, or even just go find what users are already no, doing. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and, uh, and then I think I just wanted to kind of um, move to, because you, you said, you know, very quickly you said, oh, I'll come to what the platforms can and can't do later. And maybe you want to tell us a little bit about your experience in actually interacting with a platform and trying to, to get it to do something. Yes. So, um, um, for example, um, uh, you know, the platform that um, it's very widely popular in Myanmar is, of course, Facebook. And we can also say that Facebook is the internet um, for, for all the people in Myanmar because um, um, there is um, people actually don't know how to uh, browse use a browser or even use a search engine but definitely people know how to use Facebook and it's the internet so when we talk about when we try to look at the challenges uh, of you know the, um, the you know the um, dangerous contents harmful contents and uh, we, we look at you know uh, what's happening on Facebook and we actually try to um, do a, a bit of stuff with them. Like for example, um, we try to you know work on um, do, uh, doing uh, campaigns uh, together with Facebook. Like for example, we did this campaign called Pansakar in Burmese, which means flower speech in 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 uh, in combating hate speech. We use flower speech. So we try to uh, do this those campaigns, but then on the other hand, they can only reach to you know a certain amount of people, and after it reached to a certain amount of people, then you know it's it's done because there's another different groups where we can actually reach using that platform, and then there are a lot of um, contents that um, that that come popping up, which is actually very dangerous that could lead to violence and conflict and so on and so forth. So we try to you know um, you know flag to Facebook, okay, this is happening, you know, what should we do with that? And since uh, around 2014, we interact with um, platforms like Facebook, um, you know, they try to do uh, a much more, you know, fix, fixing, patching in a very short, you know, uh, in a short term kind of uh, problem solving. So we were raising this content and they deleted, we raised this content and they deleted, but I think in the long term, it's um, it's actually, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not what we were actually wanted to do, but when we think about about that Facebook isn't you know that the, their system isn't actually designed to you know to you know look at pick up all these pieces you know because we saw a uh, we saw a system level vulnerabilities in Facebook and then you know and I think you know you know platform like Facebook could actually 
used in use this in identifying much more system level vulnerability rather than um, asking you know civil societies like us in different countries to flag content to them and their system level vulnerabilities for example uh, one of the um, one of the um, uh, issues that we face is actually about duplicate contents so when we were flagging contents uh, in in Myanmar not what people normally do is they don't really use the share button on, on the Facebook post. Mm -hmm. They just copy it and then they just post it as their own content. So when we're trying to combat this hateful, harmful content on Facebook, we can actually reach everything off. Yeah. Because it just, you yeah. know, reached to a certain level. So, you know, so when we, you know, so I think, uh, you know, a technology pl platform, I think they, they should also, you know, look into some of this, um, challenges that you know people face online. I mean, actual challenges as well. So, um, so, so you know, platforms like this. So we we try to you know um, send um, an open letter to uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook in uh, April this year. And um, well, we really wanted to address this. Um, the main point is um, um, equal equity because we wanted to you know because uh, because the countries that is um, actually. Um, having a lot of uh, issues, uh, primarily with uh, violence, uh, with in the forms of uh, social medias and content and so on and so forth, are actually countries from the global south, like Myanmar, we have Sri Lanka, we have Indonesia, we have some, you know, so these countries actually needed, uh, uh, you know, some, um, actually Facebook need to, you know, look into this country, mm -hmm. uh, like they they work in you know countries like the global north, mm -hmm. and then on the other hand, um, um, platforms also need to be transparent because when we talk about you know uh, how Facebook is handling all these uh, reports and hate speech and dangerous speech and so on, so we actually don't know how how that works, how algorithm works. Although Facebook is saying that they are using AI, some algorithms and so on, so forth, but we actually don't know. We actually yeah. don't know if they are combating. Uh, in a you know positive, effective way or not. So we actually want transparency on that aspect as well. So you know we sent a letter and then um, they said they are working on it and then we are watching on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and you know currently that's what we are trying to do. You know identify what are the system level vulnerability that platform has that could be solved by technology. But then you know we can actually identify them and then yeah. you know you know make, make them realize about that. Can I ask you a question? Yes. How receptive do you think platforms are to change? Uh, Sorry, I know that's, that's a really big question. question. Yes, I was yes. just wondering. <laughs> well, um, our experience is only with um, Facebook for now. So, um, I mean, in our case, um, you know, um, the, the letter that we sent uh, around April um, has a lot of media coverage, but surprisingly, only the media coverage from the um, the, the Western, you know, uh, mm -hmm. from the Western. But we have very little coverage in the in, in the um, in the in the um, in national level because you know what we are trying to do is we are trying to ask uh, you know Facebook to have much more you know accountable you know e equality and so on and so forth. But then, uh, but then on the other hand, on the national level, people actually thought we were trying to you know you know ask Facebook to provide services in, in the country. Right. So it's okay. like, you know, a different level. And, um, you know, um, so Mark Zuckerberg, you know, personally responded, he, you know, sent an you know, email, just an email. And then after that, a few weeks later, I sent a 10, you know, a big team of Facebook people to Myanmar, including people, not only the public policy team, because we've been dealing with a public policy team for quite a long time, but people from the data team, uh, research team, human rights team, they said they have it, uh, you know, and, um, and, um, and they said they're working on it, like, as always, so we are trying to <laughs> keep up but with that. But it continues that. to be a black yes, box, yes, right? Exactly, I think this is the point yeah. that exactly, exactly. they say they're working yeah, on process. Exactly, I mean, the yeah. transparency is a whole big issue about how you yeah. know, they're dealing with yeah. Yeah. I, I actually, Rachel, I wanted to ask you a question also because, um, you know, we've talked a bit about the users and, and sort of trying to see what users are doing and about the platforms and trying to see what platforms are using. And I, I wanted to put you on the spot a little bit about policy makers. Um, because of the following specific thing to do with the issue you're dealing with, which is that I know that a lot of the, of the debate around um, 
or a lot of the position of many people who are spouting transphobia on Twitter is that actually um, they're exercising their right to free speech. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think this has, you know, there's, a, there's two things here. One is, um, you know, arguing against that and, and potentially engaging policymakers in what, what, what it means when there's this level of hate yeah. online. And there's another one, which is, you, you touched on this before, you said, you know, it's very difficult for an advocacy and campaigning organization because you kind of have to go into the fray, right? And so I'm, I'm just wondering if you could comment on both of those things. How do you engage policymakers on the hate that is online, if you can, or are they not interested? And how does it change the nature of your advocacy? Does it come up? Does it percolate your advocacy? You know, yeah. your, your yes, your so it certainly does, and it, uh, it impacts our relationship with policymakers in, inevitably yeah. as well. Um, so with, with, this, uh, with this particular um, issue at the moment, um, I would say that for policymakers, the same as most other groups, um, they obviously see the level of uh, polarisation, the vitriol that's happening in the discussions at the same le level as other people. So um, for them to engage in the debate automatically gives them a side mm. as well. Um, at, which is, you know, for any for anyone who's ever worked in policy, is an incredibly difficult position to be in, especially when you're elected, because, um, you know, it's it, it pits you in a position that you know you might not necessarily want to take um, or realise that you're taking, and um, it also because of the um, because of the lack of accountability for individuals on social media, it results in a lot of hateful. You know, you taking a position, you saying something that you think is supportive of, you know, whatever whatever your position is, of supportive of a particular group, instantly will evoke a massive reaction um, from the opposing community. Um, so it becomes a very, very difficult position for policymakers. And actually what we've found is that engagement on issues is, uh, with policymakers specifically, it is almost better to... To do that face to do that in the old fashioned style face to face you know and keep yeah. that keep that offline because um, you know and it's not just digital platforms I would say media is just as just as um, yeah. just as involved in this and all kinds of traditional media um, but but yes for policymakers I think that digital uh, in in very polarizing debates um, they will find themselves by getting involved by engaging they will find themselves as part of one or another mm -hmm. digital community which yeah. is not necessarily a place that they want to be in yeah. um, which can sometimes be perceived as lack of interest um, or lack of caring um, so it's it's a hard balance to strike I would yeah. say um, in relation to advocacy um, and particularly as a as a campaigning organization ourselves um, you know, it's an ongoing discussion that we have pretty much daily um, to think about how and when and what we engage on. Um, because, um, as you say, it's impossible in, impossible for us from a moral perspective, um, from a right from a rights based perspective, to say nothing on issues. Um, but also, we understand that sometimes just being involved in the conversation, having a position, a strong position that we feel very comfortable with, um, it puts us in that polarising position mm -hmm. uh, and, and makes us, and we, we have recently, uh, as an organisation, we increasingly get um, accused of adopting a position that is, um, that is, that is in itself polarising, which is, you know, it, it's something that we're grappling with. And as you know, we're working with you to think about yeah. tactics to... Um, of, to how how we can how we can help neutralize discussions and you know bring them down a notch so that it's not all so that we can facilitate better conversations um, and not necessarily add heat to mm. conversations. Mm. Yeah, can I can I press yeah. you on one follow up thing, mm -hmm. which is th this issue around um, free speech versus hate. Yeah. Does it, has that come up with you at all when you interact with policymakers, particularly on the you know the way that the debate is playing out? On and offline. Um, yeah. So absolutely. Um, you know there is uh, free speech is of course something that's incredible. You know it's a massive debate into itself. Where where does free speech begin and hate speech start? And you know yeah. what's the kind of uh, what are the parameters for that? But you know debate and discussion are a hundred percent necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
But I think the parameters around those conversations are just as important. Mm -hmm. um, and determining what, how, we, how we engage in respectful yeah. conversations that allows people to have their views and their opinions and recognising that there are such a wide variety of views on you know, every issue and the issue that we talk yeah. about a lot particularly. Um, but making sure that those conversations remain respectful and don't actually um, impact on other people's identities and you know their personal um, you know who they are is, is increasingly something that we're grappling with. Yeah. yeah. Susan, I wonder whether you would like to say anything about that from your experience. Um, what I would most like to do, if it's okay, yeah. is to offer some of the uh, contrarian, odd, yeah. um, um, innovative, as we Americans pronounce it, uh, experiments that I that I've come across. Yeah. Um, in part because I gestured to that, but also because I, I I'd love to hear what uh, all of you think, and maybe even what members of the audience think. Um, there is, for example, a project uh, that was done in Brazil after a terrible, and in response to a particularly horrible surge of racism online, yeah. after um, Maria Julia Coutinho, uh, an Afro-Brazilian um, journalist, was appointed to a, a, a particularly visible role on the, on the main national um, TV network. So an Afro-Brazilian um, women's rights organization, Criola, worked together with an advertising agency to do a project they called Mirrors of Racism. Mm -hmm. And the, the contrarian um, method was this. They went and found particularly loathsome and shocking examples of racism that people had posted mostly on Twitter or on Facebook. And instead of trying to suppress it, after all, you know, I mentioned before that usually when we talk about um, ways of responding to vitriol and hatred and dangerous speech online, usually we look to um, companies and governments. There's also only one method that overwhelmingly dominates the discussions, and that is take it down, delete it, censor it, get rid of it. So this project did exactly the opposite, what, what uh, we are calling amplifying it. They literally took those, um, those vicious racist comments and made them enormous, literally printed them in huge letters on billboards, which they located in the neighborhoods where the people who had posted those comments live. So notice also that this was a, an interesting way of literally invading the actual community, the physical community mm -hmm. of the people who had posted these very racist comments. Mm -hmm. And so on gigantic billboards, they posted these terribly racist comments with a slogan that was consistent in the campaign. And the slogan is, goes something like, um, virtual racism, comma, real consequences. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, showed the profile photograph of the person who had posted um, the, the racist comment, which you would think would, of course, expose them to a dog pile, to a tremendous uh, uh, yeah. surge of attacks, potentially both online and offline. Mm -hmm. Because again, this, this, was a, this was activism that moved from the online space to offline to the actual neighborhood where these people live, except that they made the very interesting uh, decision to blur the photograph, mm -hmm. to blur the profile photo. And this, it's the only campaign I know of that did this. Mm -hmm. That means that the person who posted mm -hmm. that comment could, of course, recognize both the comment and the photograph, and that person's actual friends could probably make out, you know, recognize who it was, but not anybody else, but not strangers. That is to say, they indirectly mobilized the actual community, the true community of the people who had posted these things. And then they um, interviewed passers-by walking past those billboards and said, how do you feel? What does it make you, you know, think when you see, when you see these comments? And, and people said things like, well, we Brazilians like to think of ourselves as not racist, but 
this forces us to confront, you know, the racism in our society. And then uh, the campaigners also contacted each of the people who had posted these comments and got one of them to respond. And uh, he was then filmed in a video that you can find online even now, in which he tries to explain why he did it, and then eventually he apologizes in the course of this video. It's pretty stunning. So that's just one example of a, of a totally contrarian, you know, different response. And um, uh, there is an, a, a group, I'll just maybe very quickly mention two others. Is that okay? There, there's, uh, yep. sure. there's one uh, group that was started by um, a woman called Mina Denert in Sweden. I can't pronounce it, but the name of the group is something like, please, if you're Swedish, forgive me, uh, something like Jägerhead, which means I am here. Mm -hmm. So she founded this group, and it is uh, there are tens of thousands of people in it, and they collectively, systematically respond to what they see as hatred online, and they follow certain rules to keep their uh, discourse more civil than what they're responding to. And now there is a big group, Ich bin here, a German one, I am here, uh, it's in Slovenia, it's in Canada, the UK, there are nine different countries where these groups are active. And in, in collectively there are more than 100,000 people taking part. So this is, um, I, I think, something like a set of online communities that really bears uh, scrutinizing. I, I am wondering to what extent that's unifying and to what extent it's polarizing, which leads me to the last example, although I, I can't resist saying that um, we've collected more than 50 of these examples and are soon going to publish a paper on all of them and you can yeah. look for that on our website. Um, uh, we've also found many individuals who are, who are doing this sort of thing and one of them is a, a German guy called Hasnaim Kazim. He is of Pakistani origin. He writes for Der Spiegel, a very well-known uh, German news magazine. And lots of uh, Germans have written to him um, in quite uh, unpleasant ways, demanding to know how dare he comment on things German and on Germany yeah. when he's this brown Muslim guy. So, of course, he was born in Germany, you know, German is his native language, he's German. And then they say, passport is not enough for you to be a richtige, a real German. Um, and he's had lots of different dialogues with people. He has made it his practice to respond, yeah. um, often with humor. For example, in one case, he said to a guy who was writing to him from a little village in southern Germany, Hasnain said, well, um, I would actually like to go and visit you in your little village so that I can come and actually experience what real, true, proper German life is like. And the guy said, oh, I'm not sure that would be a very good idea. And then Hasnain said, no, no, it's a great idea. And, you know, as you know, uh, since I'm Muslim, I have lots of wives and, you know, many cousins. And we'll be coming in a bus. We'll be 40 or 50 people, you know. And... Uh, the guy said, oh, I definitely won't be home, and this went on. And then somebody else suggested also that passport is not enough. You have to do other things to be a real German. So Hasnain has recorded a video of himself playing on a traditional little German flute, mm -hmm. the German national anthem, mm -hmm. and various other things. And, um, you know, many of them are funny, but then there's also an extraordinary interview in which he says, I am trying to make the case that you can be a real German, even if you're not blonde and blue-eyed, yeah. even if you look like me, even if you are Muslim. And so I, uh, of course, this bears systematic study. Yeah. But he, and he's now published an extraordinary book with lots of these actual examples of his, of his um, dialogues with people. Uh, from reading them, it does seem that he is diminishing polarization in at least some cases. You know, yeah. he is making the case. Yeah. So I think that I think this is it's very interesting these examples that you share and that you've collected all of these um, and uh, and it's a it's quite a hopeful note you know, to think about the ways in which we can begin to engage to shift um, towards less polarization. Um, 
I, you know, I can't help but think about the work that Stonewall is doing as well. Um, and they won't make your paper because it's published. It's <laughs> but they're, but oh, they're also you never know. Let's about, talk. <laughs> <laughs> but they're also thinking about what exactly yeah. are the tactics that we can use to systematically try to have a, a more human, more connected experience mm -hmm. um, online. And I know Mido has also thought about you know different ways to, to encourage people to, to kind of consume media in ways that are that are less polarizing, right? To think about how things spread and how fake news spreads, etc. Um, so I think there's definitely a lot of kind of hope in uh, in all of these things. And um, because I'm also being our timekeeper, I know that we have um, five minutes left. So I just wanted to give you uh, all an opportunity to say one last thing if you wanted in closing for the conversations. So maybe Tyke Tyke, if you want to go first. If there's anything that you still wanted to say that we haven't had a chance to yes. cover. Yes. So um, no. I um, this would just be me repeat, uh, kind of repeating myself because, you know, um, you know, it's actually, I mean, when we talk about digital communities, you know, whether we are uh, trying to make it much more um, um, in a positive way or polarizing it, it's not just, you know, it's not used in kind of finger pointing, just one entity, which is, you know, right now we are trying to do that to, you know, in, you know internet platforms. I think, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of um, solutions and also a lot of um, problems lies between the different kind of entities as well, like, for example, the users, which is also very important. So we have to, you know, think about much more, you know, very creative way, um, you know, capacity building or research or, you know, to actually kind of tackle issues on the very basic users level. On the other hand, the policy makers will also play a very big big role as well. So, you know, you know different entities really, you know. Thank you. I suppose to end on a hopeful yeah. point, um, I think that it's really important to emphasize that digital communities can be incredibly positive mm -hmm. and incredibly affirming. And um, in fact, enabling conversations to happen in those spaces mm -hmm can mean so much, can connect people in a way that they've never ever been able to be connected before um, and can also have a massive impact on people's you know day-to-day -day and also you know day-to-day -day lives so um, whilst I know that you know we experience a huge amount of negativity and we see um, digital communities in you know as part of a part polarization there's impact there's obviously a big relationship with fake news and how how messages spread I think that their value and their ability to bring people together is something that we definitely shouldn't underestimate two points one is that um, some of the most interesting uh, efforts I've seen including by Tai Tai and Mido and and in Myanmar generally have joined the online and offline worlds and the and and include efforts online and offline it's easy to forget that it's possible to do both um, and the other thing is that from peace building in general we have lots of examples of um, creative contrarian um, even sort of uh, daring, odd initiatives mm -hmm. that have brought people together in, in uh, unexpectedly successful ways. Mm -hmm. And so I think that those of us who think about the online world would do very well, not only to attend all those fantastic workshops uh, here at this conference, but also just to, to pay close attention to the whole body of work. For example, uh, Elena, you mentioned the urban sociology at the beginning yep. of the 20th century. That is a great source of ideas and information. So even though the online world feels still comparatively new, um, human knowledge and, and experimentation and particularly uh, efforts to build peace and diminish polarization are not new. So we can, we can mm -hmm. learn from you know, colleagues and, and, and other pioneers, yeah. let's say. And digital communities are just another type of community, so yeah. another manifestation of the human experience. Yeah, yeah. Thank you all so much for this wonderful conversation, and we'll move straight into the short talks now. Thank you. Thank you.